Looks like we've got a decent number of people. Anyone new who joined, please feel free to rename yourself and make sure it actually has your name on it. Otherwise, it can't assign you host 500. And I think we are good to go. So we're going to go with our first presenter, Marley. Marley, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. It's so good to see you all. I'm always excited to be in the Globe Annual Meeting, even one way or another. I, um, you should know me as I'm related to clouds, see my background. I'm also now part of the Globe Science Working Group. So today I'm going to talk about clouds in a changing climate, storytelling as a method to collect data. Um, this was a project, sorry, done with the Globe student bloggers, which we heard about today. So please go and watch the past videos and these new videos coming out every Wednesday. Earlier this year, we had the 2022 Cloud Challenge, Clouds in a Changing Climate, and we reached out to these excellent student bloggers or bloggers, and we, had, we gave them a special assignment. They had to go into their community and ask elders, community members, teachers, friends, and themselves two questions. First, what have you noticed about the clouds and the climate where you are at? Second, how have clouds and climate changed over time? What have you noticed? And they recorded these videos. So the video is available on the GLOBE program's YouTube channel, so I invite you to watch it. When you hear the stories, there's a lot there that I want to point out. So in different regions, remember that the GLOBE student bloggers are in different regions. A lot of them reported less clouds that then lead to less rain than in the past. I want to remind this group that there's only two cloud types, two, 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 that produce precipitation. So once you stop seeing those types of clouds, that will have a huge impact in your region. What's interesting is South Africa, Philippines, and Saudi Arabia all reported seeing less of those specific raining clouds. Oops, sorry. Other regions reported more extreme weather. So if it was raining, if it's the raining season, it was dramatically increased. If it's a summer season or a heat season, it was dramatically increased. So these extreme, very, very extreme weather. So not just it's hot, it's like it's sculpturing hot. So very interesting as well, United States, South Africa, and India, which is particularly interesting this point of India because um, Lakshmi interviewed a climate scientist in India. Increased temperatures. So this was, I love this one from Malta because Hannah interviewed her grandmother and what her grandmother spoke about is the use of air conditioners. So think of things that you use in your everyday to notice changes. So um, her grandmother Grace talks about not needing air conditioners in the past and nowadays in recent times you could not live without an air conditioner. That's a huge change right there. Um, cloud cover. So our, one of our students in South Africa noticed that changes in winter and summer in cloud cover. Remember not all clouds cast shadows, not all clouds are created equal. So cloud cover will also have an effect in the temperature and what you experience. So again, really neat things that you'll notice in the videos. I love Maya because she focuses on her birthday. It's a day we all remember, our birthday, right? So she talks about, and maybe you have another important date. So here are more tips that our vloggers brought up. Her birthday used to be very rainy and cloudy, and now in recent years, it's no longer rainy. And she used to complain about wearing, having to wear a school uniform. Again, all these things that you do in your regular time because it would be too hot, but now they need a jacket. So her and her student and her friends have noticed all these changes in just the last few years. 
So it's incredible when you think, just think of clouds and the climate and how they can relate together. Typical drives that you go and you do every day. This teacher talks about you used to be clearer when he would leave the school or go to the school and now there's more smog and haze. So again, think of some of those routines that you can do to notice changes in your environment without having to necessarily take observations. Please take observations, right? That's what we want you to do, particularly clouds right now, so we would hit the one million. But again, when you're talking with the community, you can do dates, you can do um, drives or locations that you tend to visit a lot. And what have you noticed? What changes have you noticed? So I've highlighted some of the things that the student bloggers have presented. I invite you to look at them because those stories do have a lot of science credibility. We would just need to dig into the data, but I'm sure that your minds are going, oh, if I dig into temperature data, clouds data, air quality data, you can prove or you can show what they've noticed. The new season has started or will start. So every Wednesday, be sure to learn about the new, new group. And I want to acknowledge my co-authors, Autumn Burdick and Jen Heider. So thank you so much. And I'm open for questions. Thank you so much, Marley. Does anybody have questions? Uh, Marley, this is Lisa. I was just wondering if any of these students uh, did a, a project where they actually used GLOBE data or maybe some other data source to corroborate the verbal observations that they got from the people they interviewed. I don't think they have yet, right? This happened in December into January. So it's an interesting thing to maybe reach out to them and say, huh, have you considered doing this as a project? So this is why I'm bringing it today too as well. If you have any students, these simple questions can lead to interesting projects. Thanks for bringing that up, Lisa. I see a question about droughts. I've heard reports about droughts, Malika, um, not necessarily from the Globe student bloggers, but yes, there are locations with a lot of droughts and desertification, so deserts stretching or getting into more locations. Definitely have heard that. Marley, hi, Becky. I loved your presentation. You've given me so many good ideas about how to integrate what people sense or feel is going on. And that allows you to then integrate that with the geoscience. So there's the different ways of knowing and personalizing the impacts. And so um, I'll be reaching out to you as I, I move forward because I, I want to uh, do something similarly to as what you're doing. So thank you so much. Thank you. And I'll keep answering questions in the chat so that we can keep moving on. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. All right. We are moving on to our next presentation, which I believe is one I need to share a video for. So give me just one second. All right. Can everyone see the video? Yep. OK. Hi everyone, my name is uh, Malika and uh, Dr. Chris from School of Sai, Wallenlach University. We would like to present develop teachers to become a globe place-based learning coach. Why would we do globe? The main answer is it's fun, right? Globe has great protocols, they have several apps, uh, they have great platform we call IVSS, and uh, it's a great place to do research collaboration. The benefits to use place-based learning approach uh, for implementing the GLOBE program. Uh, 
as far as we're concerned, we think there are four benefits at least. The first one is support school-wide efforts to implement pace-based learning with uh, sustainability. The second one, it, it helps educators transition to scientific methods. And the third one is, is ensure student research collaborative projects with uh, students from around the world. And the last one is it provides the opportunity for students to present their place-based learning projects on the IVSS platform. When you take students outside, okay, to do place-based learning approach, there are four things that you need to think about. You have to take students to some place that really, really beautiful, okay? It's very rich in culture, okay? And it would be uh, a great place if that place also have a high biodiversity. And when students go outside, if that place has some uh, problems or something to solve, the story or the project will have great impacts on the community. If you have four components of these, I think that would be the right place to do place-based learning approach. Uh, when you ask uh, how long that Chris and I have been doing a uh, place-based learning approach, um, we at least one of the school that we doing it con continuously and they submit it uh, on the IVSS is, uh, is uh, some Saint Vitali school. We start uh, in 2018. The, the teacher asking Chris where should uh, they are going to take students to do some uh, problem-based learning. So Chris suggests, why don't we go up north to Chiang Rai province uh, at, that, uh, at that place Chris implementing uh, several globe uh, protocols, okay? And we submit one of the project is on mosquito larvae and water quality in Chiang Rai province, uh, Northern Thailand. And in 2020, uh, the teacher contact Chris again and asking, okay, last time we went up north, this, this time they want to go down south. So Chris said, why don't we go to an island? So we choose uh, Samui Island is in southern part of Thailand. Uh, during uh, in 2020, we did at least uh, five uh, student IVS projects. Okay, so we went to the place, a uh, student formulate research questions, and then we uh, we together with teacher and also student decided which group protocols that they is going to do. Okay. So in 2021, uh, the school contact us again. So uh, the, the story is that we went to Renong province and that province is uh, bordering with uh, Myanmar. So the project is related to Thai and Myanmar community. And this year, okay, we also uh, choose Krabi in southern part of Thailand. Uh, they also uh, submitted uh, five uh, IVS project. Okay, so at Krabi Island, uh, at Krabi Province, uh, Chris divided project into uh, two subgroups. The first one is some something related to the beach. Okay, so the first uh, three project IVS project is something about going to the beach and find some uh, research question and we implementing some of the growth protocol with the students. And the, the last two is about going to the temple. So for the temple, uh, we ask students to look around and come up with research project, okay? Uh, all those uh, five uh, five projects from Sam Saint Michelai School, they submitted on the IVSS. And as you can see that, uh, they got four and three star uh, uh, projects and uh, at least all of them received two or more badges earned. I would like to point out about place-based uh, learning uh, in Gabi uh, province, Thailand. Uh, I would like to select uh, 
the one with the temple. So when we went to the temple, we realized that temple divided into two, uh, two groups. The first group is a high tourist temple. We have so many uh, tourists visiting the temple, and uh, there are second group of temple that not many uh, tourists visited. So student asking, uh, would mosquito related to number of tourists? Uh, you can imagine the high tourist place also has more monks uh, uh, stay at the temple. Okay, and the second the second group of student uh, they noticed that. Uh, in high uh, high tourist place in high tourist uh, temple uh, there are more visitor and also there are more incense burning and also more candle light up okay so they would like to do something about the pm 2.5 at the site uh, in uh, in this project chris asked student to do cloud app uh, and three of the project uh, they went to the beach and they uh, thinking about doing uh, something about microplastic. They look, uh, they look at the boat uh, at the beach and they realize that uh, at the tourist site, there are also uh, many tourist boats, is a long tail boat. Okay, so they want to uh, relate number of boats with the environment and also um, use uh, machine learning, they call deep learning. These are example of a student research project that student presented uh, at the time. Uh, this also example of student doing PM 2.5. Uh, besides uh, some saints school, there are also other schools, which is, for example, like Durapon Sai School in Trang, they're also doing place-based learning. Uh, if you think place-based learning is um, a great way to do global project in your uh, in your area, uh, I am sure that you guys will enjoy it. And if you have any question or suggestion, uh, please contact Chris or me through this email. Thank you for listening. Enjoy doing global. All right. Thank you so much, Malika. I'm going to hand it over to you for questions now. Yeah, uh, the Malika, very great uh, thing, the place-based learning, um, Hamid here. So your previous uh, science, work, science working group member. Uh, Hello, Malika. Hamid, thank you so much. Yeah, the question, small uh, clarification is that the last criteria, uh, which is impact, are you uh, talking about uh, the impact which the students research is going to create or the impact, environmental uh, impacts, which is uh, started happening in the place uh, study site? Uh, what we mean by impact is that uh, when yeah. we ask students to do things, I want them to realize that what, even though it's a school student, right? But they can make impact to the community. So instead of asking them to, uh, observe number, I mean, like rainfall or something, we asking uh, what kind of environmental problems that the, that particular location might be facing and how they're going to fix it and uh, what kind of global protocols that might help them answer uh, those kind of questions. Okay. Thank you, I got it. It's a very great work, fantastic. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, if if uh, Hamid, uh, if you're in Oman and you have some uh, particular spots uh, that you want student to do, you can group student into many many sub projects. And this is uh, would be a great way to uh, after the student sharing the idea. Okay, so that means uh, one big place, right? But you answer uh, have your student answer from different angle. And that way you understand and student understand the whole picture of the community. I think uh, I think that's I think what that's what student really enjoyed about because after we finish this, uh, all five groups are presenting their fighting. So they learn from each other and they asking questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, have, yeah, I, have some, I have something to add here. Can you hear me? Uh, at the end of the, you know, the, the studies, we actually invite uh, the community uh, to 
listen to the presentation. And for example, uh, one of the group that doing the microplastic on specific island on, on you know, in on to be uh, see, uh, they actually found a lot of, you know, microplastic related to the foam. Okay, so that way the company knows about this and they will help, you know, cleaning up the beach, cleaning up all the foam before they actually break down into uh, uh, microplastics. Okay, that's, that's what I, uh, we mean by, you know, impacts to the community as well. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. So we are actually going to move questions to the chat for this group, and we will be moving on to our next group, which is Gregory, Elena, and Katie. So if you guys want to start sharing. All right. Well, I guess I'll go ahead and start, Katie. Good morning, everybody. At least it's morning here in Fairbanks, Alaska. And I'm here with my colleagues, Dr. Katie Spellman and Dr. Elena Sparrow. And we're presenting our work to expand the globe to undergraduates and pre-service teachers at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And Elena? Good morning. Uh, today we are sharing this event with you from Fairbanks, Alaska. And uh, as you can see, uh, there's, there's where Alaska is on this map. Uh, we are on the traditional and unceded homelands of the Dene people of the Lower Tanana River. We acknowledge and honor them, their past and current relationship to and care of the land. We are committed to bringing, to building long-term reciprocal partnerships with indigenous individuals and organizations in support of their sovereignty and self-determination. So we welcome you to this presentation. And Katie will, uh, Dr. Katie Spellman will be the next. Um, Elena is always inspirational to me because she's been working with, like you, Malika, she's been watching kids grow up and become scientists. And I am one of those kids. Um, and we have been working really hard. We're one of the um, NASA science activation projects. And in that project, we have been um, working to better get GLOBE resources into the hands of undergraduates. And we are gonna highlight three different programs where we're working to do that and figure out good mechanisms. Cause it, you know, there's some, there's some hard parts for undergraduates. Um, for example, you know, like the teacher, you know, do they enroll as a teacher so they can enter their data? Do they enroll as a student? Cause they're actually a student. Um, and we've been, been working those kind of issues out. Um, we do a pre-service teacher training, a community college research intensive for first generation college students. And we have embedded it in a new undergraduate academic program at our university called the Climate Scholars Program. Greg will take us through our pre-service teacher work first. Okay. My part in this collaboration is that I worked with the School of Education at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And we set up a workshop for elementary student teachers. We found over the years that these elementary teachers are a little hesitant to fully engage with STEM inquiry. And, and, and you can imagine why that might be. Elementary teachers may not have a depth of content in the sciences. They don't know how inquiry can be used to facilitate student engagement, to really drive student involvement. And so helping them understand inquiry is part of what we do as well. And finally, and not finally, but another thing that we noticed was that they don't necessarily have the tools to answer the questions that the students ask. So recognizing that is uh, kind of the goal or the purpose of the workshop that, that got implemented. The other thing about this is they don't recognize the resources that they have in this community. 
The uh, School of Ed at the University of Alaska places teachers all over the state. So in urban environments, in villages, in uh, riverine environments, in ocean environments, all over the state. So recognizing that local knowledge is, is key to getting student involvement and uh, helping the students understand this. Now, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to kind of mess up when I say students and student teachers, and you're going to say, like, who is he talking about? <laughs> but I, I really think of them as teachers, and I think of their, you know, youngsters as students, and, and I'll try to work through the, the language here as we go forward. And finally, we're going to share GLOBE protocols uh, with our students. So this is a screenshot from the workshop itself. Now, it, I wouldn't necessarily call it a workshop. It's a couple class sessions. Um, typically in the elementary program in the spring semester, they have their science content class. So we uh, come into the science content class for a couple lectures and a couple presentations to work through this, um, the, these goals with our students. So we hope when we're done that they walk away with an understanding of the connection between their life and climate change. We hope that they understand their place in the Arctic and how the Arctic can drive worldwide um, factors and how the worldwide factors are in fact affecting the Arctic. And that finally, as we mentioned earlier, that they gain some experience with the GLOBE tools. I hope that you can see this screen. Um, this is an ongoing model that has been developed jointly with Arctic and Earth Signs and with the Association of Interior Nas Native Educators. And it's a, it's a model that has been used really effectively to engage students and engage the community. And when I listened to Mullica's presentation, our previous speaker, this really hit home the way that these two projects are really uh, dovetailed together. We're, we're really doing the same thing. Um, you'll And I like to call it the scientific process, kind of an expanded scientific process. It starts in the upper left-hand corner with the Alaska Native elders. So we use local knowledge to introduce some of these concerns to the students, or we hope we do. And then our student teachers recognize those resources. The students, their students, begin to ask questions, begin to wonder about some of the things that these elders have noticed. They can set up some inquiry experience, and this is where we like to help our student teachers. And as these, the inquiry goes ahead, they can experiment, they can collect data, they can post data to GLOBE, and they can use the GLOBE data to help answer some of their questions. And the, the really neat part of this is the stewardship aspect of it. Again, which I l listened to the previous speaker, um, that, that's happening. Um, you know, I, we're going to see that, I think, in these community presentations. So is there something that the students can do for the community, in the community, that's going to help our community um, adapt and respond to some of the things that are happening? One of the first things we do when we start the, the class is to introduce a personal climate change map. So this has a, a couple of uh, key things that we'd like to use. First of all, it, we ask our students to think of a place that's near and dear to them and then uh, think about some changes that have occurred over, the, over time probably their lifetime, again, they're student teachers, so they're adults, and then they get to share it with the group. So as we're sharing it with the wider group, we learn about each other, we learn um, where they're from, where they've been, where they are now, and we get to, uh, we build community that way. Then we model some uh, concept mapping. We group them. There's, there's going to be similarities no matter what. There's going to be similarities and some people are going to notice it's drier. Some people are going to notice it's cloudier. Some people are going to notice the glaciers are melting. And so we can bring all those together and, and model concept mapping, which is something that I, I would argue that student teachers probably need a little help with. And then finally, we work with them to pose questions that can be tested using collectible data. And that's the key to this entire workshop is using this inquiry to engage the students and, and help our student teachers get better at it. And where do the observations come from? Well, you guessed it, okay? It's the GLOBE observations. We, they can use the GLOBE observations to ask and answer questions. 
Um, we train them in Globe Observer. Some and actually the workshop changes uh, sometimes over the years, but and we've also used Globe Land Cover. So using these protocols helps our student teachers share out this with the their younger students. And then, of course, time time uh, permitted, we're going to work with them to grab the Globe database. Uh, and so that they can start to answer some of those bigger questions that they might have. And I want to I want to point out that this this hopefully doesn't stop here. We invite our student teachers to then become teachers to come to Globe workshops that IARC and UAF and Arctic and Earth Science put on. So that's my part of this is engaging student teachers in using Globe. And now I'm going to hand off the baton to my colleague Katie. That Marilei, there's the one millionth observation right there in the slide. <laughs> Actually, uh, it's me who, who is going to uh, be speaking now. It's about the climate research intensive course for first generation community college students. And uh, they, they want, they haven't experienced, they're students who are not biology majors, all, all of them, but some come you know, from engineering or business or, you know, non-science majors. And uh, they have, they come with an expectation of uh, uh, experiencing some research. And they originally thought that they would be doing a part of somebody's um, research, ongoing research, but we have them actually um, conduct their own investigation. So we have field methods training on the UAF campus. We have project planning and research design. And, uh, and what's important is we have mentors that work with them. And then uh, we use GLOBE protocols for the soil sampling and analysis that happens that uh, they decide after they decide what question they uh, would like to investigate, then they design their experiment and and go out to the field to do it. And also then go back and do the lab work. For example, weighing and drying and reweighing soil samples. Next slide, please. And then the important, uh, another fun part is the data analysis and discussion. And, uh, and so they have at the end of this uh, climate research intensive course, they have a poster and uh, a presentation at a symposium uh, at the end of the, uh, the experience and uh, the opportunity for them to peer review each other's project. And so get into the process of how scientists, regular scientists do it. And this gives them the, the tool and they actually have a product to share at other professional presentations. Uh, the, for example, the Society of Hispanic Professional Injuries Conference, the Santa Ana, where college STEM week conference, the Rancho Santiago Community College and Board of Trustees and other uh, STEM conferences that they, they uh, then uh, use that poster and investigation to share with other students. Next slide, please. And so the climate research intensive course, we have had five cohorts to date and with 60 total students. And this has led, gave them, given them the confidence to be able to do what they, they uh, think they are capable to do. Some of them came and never thought of science and didn't actually say that they were interested in science because they had never been exposed to it. And so uh, this gave them the confidence to do, uh, go beyond and push their own uh, limits. And so they, some of them have, you know, opened uh, new professional networks, retention in STEM major and acceptance to graduate school. And, uh, and we have had, you know, retrospective pre and post responses and they have increased their confidence, their likelihood to enter a scientific uh, poster in a competition, knowledge of the de development and presentation of scientific research and interest in climate change. And so um, I, the, the, they had 
they they are able to see uh, how the mentoring goes with scientists and how to how to collaborate as scientists uh, in their investigation project. And so we've had really good uh, uh, results. With we actually have a student now who he's, she's a graduate student who started with the research experience and came back and she's even published in science. She's one of the co-authors, her project uh, was included in a worldwide study. So thank you. Uh, next is Katie. Um, you can, I love how already in this community session, we're seeing um, convergent themes across these three presentations already. Storytelling, sense of place, sense of personal responsibility of place. We are already um, converging on our ideas. So like any good program designers, we started um, our work in all three of these with a comprehensive needs assessment of our audience. And this um, needs assessment included like um, student focus groups and um, literature review and their um, UAF as we are at the top of the world, you know, in the Arctic. We, we um, started recognizing students' desire to learn more about climate change um, in a place where it's happening most rapidly in the world, the Arctic, um, was a, a, could be a recruitment tool. <laughs> the university was like, we're going to start a, um, a climate scholars program. And they knew about our work at Alaska Globe, and they recruited me to be one of the founding faculty members of this program. And of course, GLOBE is deeply embedded into our formal academic programming in the Climate Scholars Program. And we designed the program using information from that needs assessment and, um, and are trying to hit these concepts. Um, the, these are what the, the literature um, to date has identified as key thinking skills, key competencies for students coming out of undergrad who will be equipped to address climate change issues. And um, at the core are these content skills, but systems thinking, normative com competence, that's like, you know, understanding that value systems shift, right? Interpersonal, strategic, anticipatory, imagining the future, using data to imagine the future. And um, Marile, I loved hearing those stories of the students learning from the past. And then um, as Greg showed, we then teach the students how to use the, the learning from the past to connect to the present, their data, and then imagine the future and avenues for action. And that's what the students said that they wanted. We know from Greta Thornburg, right? Students, the youth want action today. They don't wanna sit around and wait for climate change to happen, they want action. So we tried to build that into our actual academic programming. Um, we teach a core course called Our Changing Climate, past, present, future. And it's um, similar to our intensive. It supports students from any major who wanna look at climate change from any lens. And all students, whether they're an anthropology major, art major, or biology major, um, have to complete a globe research project. And um, an example of one is we use globe land cover to, um, to investigate ice cover. And this is also part of our Fresh Eyes on Ice project, which is a NASA citizen science project that we've started. Um, they, we, we had the students doing, doing satellite matches on their own uh, without, without artificial intelligence like Marile and, and Tina are doing with clouds. They went in and looked at the satellite imagery on Sentinel Hub and they matched their land cover observations and they quantified how valuable that globe photo data is. Um, and it's not a surprise, the globe data is very valuable because it can capture observations of ice when we have dense cloud cover in the winter in Alaska. So they, they were able to quantify. I just threw this in Marile because of some of the questions coming out in your session um, in Alaska. So some of our, our climate scholar students took on clouds and they analyzed the cloud cover data in Alaska. Um, over the past decade, 2012 to 2022. And um, I, I was just curious, I was like, oh, two, there's two types of NIMBOs, right? <laughs> and um, in Alaska over the past decade, we are seeing a decreasing trend in NIMBO stratus clouds, our, our students found. Don't pay attention to that 2020, the students shouldn't have included 2022 because it wasn't over yet. 
Um, and we're seeing very little trend through time through the decade of cumulonimbus. That's, that's, that was for you, Marile, and for the person who asked that question in the chat. Um, and then we have our climate scholar students also join in on our um, climate research intensive and get immersed in GLOBE as they do that. So we are so happy to be extending GLOBE resources to undergraduates. And um, please let us know if you have any questions about our programs or how we're working with undergrads in GLOBE Alaska. And, and I think that there's going to be another presentation by Christy, somebody on our team, about another undergraduate uh, course that uses GLOBE. Great. Allison, I love I love that too. It you and we were at, we have actually documented that effect, Allison, on um in our project, our evaluation. Like the connections make a big difference on the way students think about their work. And we see that in our student interviews and um, our teacher interviews, being a part of something bigger has a huge effect. And I'm sure that those student vloggers would say the same. Can we ask question now? Of course. Um, I would like to kudos uh, three of the presenters. Uh, you guys are excellent uh, present, uh, presenter. Uh, I would like to ask how, how do you get community involved? I mean, look like you have done several sessions on having uh, uh, you know, local community and talking about the climate change. And you have done wonderful of that. Um, would you mind to share uh, your thinking with us? I, I, I would love to do it in Thailand too. Thank you. So I, I, I could give one example. We have, we also offer a climate change in my community course. And this is um, not only for educators, teachers, but also for youth group leaders and, and community members. Because in Alaska, especially in from remote villages, uh, teachers, you know, tend to not stay too long. And because of this, rapid turnover of uh, educators in the community, we try and include community members because after all, the, the, co the community members are very much interested in getting their youth educated and involved in what's happening. And so part of the uh, project of the team project is to, you know, of course, engage their youth, but also to connect uh, as what Greg had explained in our learning cycle model, to start with what is important in the community, what are their concerns, and so they they have done that. And one example that was done was the uh, presentation of students in uh, Ireland who were concerned about uh, erosion in their community, and they were uh, because to them loss of land is loss of heritage because you lose history as, as uh, houses plummet down, then you lose that piece of history. And they were very much concerned. So they did a GLOBE study and, and presented that. And not only to their own community and to the tribal council and had recommendations for them. For example, they recommended because there was the erosion, there were, they uh, investigated the causes of this er erosion happening in their uh, community. So they recommended the uh, uh, no wake zone uh, on the river that is, you know, right next to the to their village, and to uh, in, um, have an alternate way of anchoring boats instead of them anchoring it into the the ground, which then causes the pulling. Uh, uh, they suggested a uh, an anchor so that there's definite places so that it doesn't cause erosion. And also the recommendation that more uh, uh, vegetation, you know, be along the 
uh, and so the the uh, advantage of uh, using starting with uh, local and indigenous knowledge for this uh, population that we are wanting to reach, and which who are you know mostly the the population of our students in rural Alaska, is um, to to not to build on the knowledge that is there and the knowledge they have learned from their elders and include the culture. And so the students uh, actually wrote a story, actually a song about their project and then even danced to it. So, so it's, it's like a full circle. That's just one of examples. We have other examples. In our, in our undergrad course, Malika, we um, require it, we model it at the beginning of the semester. We bring in elders to into the class, you know, so that they're in, they're there. And then it's, it's worth point, you know, undergrads don't do things unless it's worth points. <laughs> on their, so that and then interviewing um, local knowledge holders and experts, then they have to do it after we model it. And then, and it's worth the worth points for the course. So that's another a little more heavy handed way to do it. Just wondering, you do pre-service training for like using global protocols. I just wondering what uh, what what is the most popular global protocol that the pre-service pre student loved it most? Clouds, obviously it's clouds. <laughs> no way. I think, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's, it's easy. easy. It's so easy. It's so easy. What do you think, Greg? Yeah, it, it, it's also related to the others. For instance, yeah. the water the water quality usually needs clouds and cloud information as well. Yeah, but it, by far and away, the clouds is the easiest one and the most fun to do. We they, do have a, well, we had a problem one fall where it was an evening class. Yeah. <laughs> we, we couldn't do cloud observations. They've done phenology also. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, for us, winter is nine months long. So the protocols that are winter <laughs> easy to do in winter are usually a hit with our teachers. So yeah, so land uh, land cover with yeah. observing ice really land cover is becoming more and more popular mm -hmm. up here. So. so many applications. Yeah. Oh, Marilyn, what do you have for us? Continue to answer questions. Yeah, we can continue to answer questions in the chat, but I think we're into a break. Is that right, Grace? So we are into a break um, after this. So let's see. Timing wise, we get back at 11.15. That's when the first presentation starts after the break. So feel free to take a break to answer questions, however you want to spend the time. We have a, a neat question from Amy in the chat. Um, so we fold in tribal indigenous knowledge. Um, did you modify any existing globe educational materials to contextualize them in an indigenous way? Why, yes, yes. we did, Amy. It's as if you went to our workshop. There's a couple of examples of um, modifying materials in, in indigenous languages. So um, Christy Buffington, who's here in the audience, she worked with um, the tri uh, Association of the Tribal Governments to um, get Globe Clouds translated into Gwich'in, which is one of our indigenous languages for interior Alaska. Um, she got her camera off. We've all, we also um, do co-produced curriculum materials with our Association of Interior Native Educators. And we, um, in those, Amy, we prioritize our indigenous um, and local values and cultural practices and start with that. And then the science is not the, the, main, the main show, right? It's like kind of the old, the old way we would do it is like student interest and like, oh, you can help NASA collect cloud data or you can, uh, you know, but now we we're like, you, you, you know, you have these values and you can, um, use science as a tool to help your community. So we kind of flip flip it from science priority to community and personal priority. And we, the all the lesson plans follow that model. Elena or Christy, did you want to add anything? Yes, I, I wanted to say that the, uh, the 
we had uh, we held uh, the first ever Glow Alaska Globe Student Research Symposium, and we revised the review form to include indigenous knowledge and and ways uh, into the criteria of the review. And then we had indigenous uh, uh, subject uh, subject matter and culture experts to be part of the review team on looking at uh, uh, projects. And, and so they even had an award from the Association of Interior Native Educators on which projects also, you know, you know, did a good job of incorporating uh, indigenous culture and knowledge in their project, in their science project. Christy, do you want to say something? Yeah, thank you. First of all, great presentation, Elena, Katie, and Greg. That was amazing uh, and very motivating for me working with all of you. And yes, uh, one thing that I've learned uh, about modifying materials um, for whoever, whomever you're working with is really going back to that needs assessment. What do people need? And so if, if, if a community says, well, you know, I need to be able to show why it's important to look at clouds in my community, then um, that's a lot of conversations that take time to get those things translated. Uh, and then it might not be something that's publicly shared through the for the whole globe audience. It could be just used for that community that it's modified with and for. So I think that's really important. I know that we had a keynote presentation about open source um, and open science. And I think that um, sometimes it's not meant to be open if a culture has sovereignty over their knowledge and language. So I'm learning a lot about that topic and um, would love to discuss it more. And I also respect everyone's need for a break. <laughs> Turn it over to you, Madeline, to close it out for the break. All right, it's break time. Our first presentation <laughs> starts at 1115. So try and be back by then. We'll give everyone about a minute to get on. So yep, feel, feel free to take a break. <laughs> Madeline, do you want to me to try to to share the slides with you and see if they're progressing? Yes, we can do that real quick during the break if you'd like. I don't want to take your time away from your break, but oh, it's no, only no, no. I'm staying on. Don't worry. <laughs> All right. Okay. So let me um, try to share a screen with you. Okay. You can see the slides, right? Yes. And if I'll uh, start from the beginning, that might be even better. Yep. Okay. And if I'll just start progressing, they, they progress, right? Yep. Okay. So we should be all set then. Great. Thank Glad you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for checking that. All right. You're doing a great job. Everything goes so smoothly. I'm really, I'm really grateful for everything you do behind the scenes, so to speak. I know how much work is involved when you're managing the virtual conference. Yeah, this is the first one that I've uh, moderated. I'm glad it's going smoothly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everything goes really well. I'm going to grab a cup of tea and I will be back momentarily. Thank you, Madeline. Mm -hmm. and my co-presenter is here, Mike. I'm going to take a cup of tea. And I will be back. And Madeline was kind to really check if our slides are progressing and everything so Please. looks smoothly. Thank you. Have a, have a cup of tea for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you.
All righty, it is 11.15. We should be starting our next presentation soon. I believe it is Eric Silva who's presenting next. All righty, I see you there. Go ahead and spotlight you. Maybe give everyone just a few more seconds to see if they want to join. <laughs> um, let's see. All righty. All right, it looks like we've got a good number of people in here. If you want to start whenever you're ready, Eric. Okay, okay, okay. One second. Hi everyone, it's okay with my screen? Yes, we can hear you and see you. Okay, okay. Hello, hello, I'm Eric from Brazil and I'm currently an education analyst for the foundation that supports the Brazilian Space Agency in its educational activities. Today I'm here to represent Dr. Aline Veloso, the coordinator of skills and technology development at AB and coordinator of the Global Program in Brazil. Dr. Aline is on a mission in the USA and invited me to represent our work to you. I hope you will enjoy our activities and that we can add it to the global community. Uh, before, uh, before the COVID-19 pandemic, Brazil had already held about 24 workshops since uh, 2016, the year we started to be part of the GLOBE program. We went to several Brazil's regions to present to the teachers the range of the possibilities key that the program can offer to the, to the classroom. Uh, we had the opportunity to go to four corners of the country, training around 690 teachers from more than 200 schools during this period. With the growth of the number of, of COVID-19 cases, it was impossible to hold face-to-face -face meetings with the isolation uh, protocols. We saw the need to adopt, adapt our work. The Global Brazil team got together and started the process of de developing teacher materials for the program that were compatible with the needs we see in Brazil. Uh, which are the lack of time to carry out extracurricular activities, the lack of laboratories, and among others. This picture of a small part of the Group Brazil team, a really, really small part. Uh, okay. The AEB Scholar Virtual is the AEB's virtual learning environment created with the aim of structuring and organizing the virtual education activities of the AEB Scholar Program, a program that coordinates all the educational activities of the Brazilian space agencies, including Globe Inter Brazil, considering um, a con of advancing the use of, use of information, communication technologies in education. That's our site. Uh, you, can, you can go ahead and, and scan this QR code to, to understand more. Okay. Uh, this educational platform is digital and 100% free, where training courses are available for students, teachers, and space enthusiasts. Uh, there, these are some examples of courses that we have already carried out in this environment. Also, in this in, in English, the, ling the language we use for the course in Brazilian Portuguese to serve our audience. Uh, 
The platform also has a library with a repository of teaching materials. In this library, we insert the translated protocols of the global program and other materials that we have already produced in the AB school program uh, on the topics of astronomy, astronautics, remote sensing, among the others. It was from this environment that we, we, we were able to carry out the Globe Brazil uh, 2021 workshop and the preparatory course for the IVSS Globe 222. Now I will show you how these courses were carried out. The Globe Brazil workshop was the first course uh, held on this platform. It was open to professors undergraduate students, researchers, and volunteer teachers. The focus of this training was on the four protocols of the global server application, clouds, mosquitoes, habitat mapper, land cover, and trees. This training uh, had the illustrious participation of the mental trainers, Dr. Dr. Aline Veloso, Professor Ines, Ma Ines Mawad is here with us, and Dr. Rusan Lowe. With the aim of supporting teachers in the de development of their activities in the classroom, the Globe Brazil team produced teaching materials for each protocol presented. Each material contained types of on how to collect data, data and how to correlate the protocols with daily school life. In these materials, we also made suggestions for lesson plans using Globe, so teachers could have something ready to use in their class to make them more attractive. The platform allowed the insertion of these materials and, divis and division of groups among the participants. In the end, we have 32 trained with uh, 30 teachers presenting their prep pre projects using one of more protocols uh, from the Global Observer application. With this, with this training carried out last year, the objective was for us to have more teachers doing school projects using GLOBE and consequently, the students presenting them at various scientific uh, dissemination events. The platform allowed us, allow us to stay connected with trained professors and it was from this point on. Uh, in February, in February on this year, we developed a course focusing on the International Virtual Science Symposium. Uh, 222, uh, where we are presenting the greatest information about the event to the entire Brazilian community. We shared the recordings of training from Globe Brazil 2022 workshop. As a result of this, of this work, three teachers were trained at the Globe Brazil 2021 workshop had their works approved for the symposium, where the students presented with great commitment for all their works at the virtual science fair of the coordination of the GLOBE program on Latin America and Caribbean. Now I will show you some images of the Brazilian presentations. It was a very emotional time for all your, our children and the scientific and cultural exchange was impressive. teacher in this. <laughs> Our most recent work was a course opening on the platform for the sites and scientists of the Global Observer, where we teach from uh, 30 years old to adults enthusiastic about environmental and scientific education tools, the application and contribute to the scientific knowledge of your, our country. We changed the language that was only teacher focused and made it more accessible, providing fun videos on how to how to help can help scientists are uh, scientists around the world. The course the course is open to everyone. If you are interested interested in knowing a little more, I invite you to access our platform. Even now, uh, that we are including uh, conducting face to face training. We still see a lot of use in the platform. It is to it is used to 
present training teachers with didactic materials to are complementary to the lectures that we give when, when we do face-to-face -face activities. The most important thing is that even, even in times of pandemics, the global Brazil community was productive, participating in workshops and carrying our projects, thus contributing to the dissemination of scientific knowledge that we joined to be very important for, for the advance for, of our country. I hope you all enjoy I, and I share our email here. If you, if you have any questions, thank you all. Thank you so much, Eric. That was a fantastic presentation. Does anybody have questions for him? Looks like you're getting lots of compliments in the chat, Eric. <laughs> nice job. Thank you. Hi. Val and I have a question. This is Allison. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I am not as versatile in Zoom and couldn't find the, uh, the raise hand button. Um, Eric, thank you for your presentation. And it's great to hear the work of um, another space agency. I was wondering if you could comment a bit about the connections that you made with the space agency and the work that was based on the platform and kind of talk about the unique perspective of being at a space agency, which is actually somewhat unusual um, in the GLOBE program. A lot of the country coordinators are based at more of an educational organization and, and both are wonderful, but they bring different um, opportunities. You're on mute, I think. Oh, okay. Uh, I I will. And uh, teacher Inez, can you help me? <laughs> my my language is very very. We very, can hear very you. Rusty. <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. Uh, will you talk about your connection of uh, being a space agency with uh with Globe? Okay. Uh, Brazil, Brazil, uh, has. Does it like very much the global program? And today we are, we are doing a, 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 um, an activity here in Brasilia uh, to disseminate the, 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 pro, the global program and other activities involved, involving, uh, it can involve the, the space activities too. Uh, Brazil has the teacher from EF to help. Uh, can I can I can I, can you help me, Inês? I... <laughs> what? <are> Sorry. You... <laughs> I think Inês is in this call. I had seen them at one point. Give me just a second. I'll see if I can find them. Okay. Okay. Here, I do see them yeah. on here. So you're doing a great job, mm -hmm. Eric. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, uh, yeah. I don't Yeah, he was Portuguese. safe. Yeah, my, your, your English is something? far superior to my Portuguese. Ah, uh, okay. Can I say something? Yes, go yes. ahead. Uh, sorry, I have to interrupt. Uh, he was saying that in, in space agents in Brazil, we have a section that education section, that one that holds all the GLOBE program. Understood? It's A and B school. Uh, they have a lot of uh, education program, not, not, only, not only GLOBE, but they have uh, all the space uh, policy to to the children, to the schools. It's a section in AB uh, with the, like it, we, you have in NASA. It's the same we have here in Brazil, in space agents. They, they are uh, teachers. 
and they are physicians and they are all kinds of teachers and all kinds of uh, science related. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, <laughs> Okay, thank you all. Thank Sorry. you, Eric. <laughs> no worries, you did fantastic. Uh, okay. All righty, we are a little bit ahead of schedule actually, but would the is the last group ready to go? Yes, if... I believe uh, Professor Mike Chabad and I, we ready whenever you are. Um, yeah. So um, is that okay if I'll start sharing the screen? Yeah, the floor is yours. All right. Um, all right, uh, give me a thumbs up if you can hear uh, us and if you can see us, all right. So, yeah. um, all right. Um, Yes, I missed the, the first slide, but anyway, this is a session uh, that is devoting uh, its content to the globe uh, community and globe science, how we can communicate science to a wider audiences and how it helps us to build the globe community worldwide. So the presenters uh, are um, Professor Mike Jabad, who will take the floor shortly. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Professor Jabat. He is a longtime GLOBE uh, leader. So I'm sure practically all of you know uh, Professor Jabat from many different programs that he is leading within the GLOBE community. And my name is Larissa Shalkin. Uh, I am from Global STEM Education Center. And as, um, as Professor Jabat, I'm also a US GLOBE partner. So, um, in this session, we will talk about um, our ways to communicate science to wider audiences by teaching about the GLOBE program, science diplomacy, United Nations environmental program, sustainable development goals, global environmental outlook. Um, it, it's being taught to the global diplomacy fellows at the UN Institute for Training and Research. And I'll give uh, a floor to uh, Dr. Mike Jabad, who will um, share uh, the further knowledge with, with you. Over to you, Mike. Good, thank you, Larissa. So uh, the work that Larissa and I are sharing uh, comes out of a joint, uh, a shared uh, realization of how important uh, the GLOBE program can be in uh, what I often call lowercase s, lowercase e, science education. So um, my course is here, uh, very much uh, paralleled uh, with the work that came from our first sequence of uh, speakers, which was just fantastic. So I think Greg from uh, University of Alaska and I have a shared responsibility in working with pre-service teachers. And so my courses here <clears throat> are very much focused on GLOBE, but also very much focused on helping those students understand how we can teach not just about the sustainable development goals, but actually teach with the sustainable development goals. So I was very, very fortunate and honored that Larissa would reach out to me and ask uh, if I would partner with her on developing these. So uh, this past year, we offered uh, sessions through the UNITAR Global uh, Diplomacy Initiative, uh, a session in the fall and a session in the spring. Um, where uh, leaders, uh, future diplomats from around the world came and worked with us uh, and with other GLOBE colleagues, uh, Brian, uh, Brian Campbell and Rusty Lowe and, uh, and uh, Peter and Peter Nelson. Uh, it was just a great, uh, great opportunity to share the power that GLOBE can have. So, um, Larissa, could you go to the next slide? Thanks. So, oh, well, I was a slide ahead in thanking them for uh, coming on board. So uh, Peter Nelson, I think also uh, joined in on this group and shared out uh, the work that they had with the land cover initiative, uh, uh, the intensive op uh, observation period. 
that was going on. Um, we tried to go through and help them understand the uh, the uniqueness of GLOBE. I mean, GLOBE is uh, just an incredible, incredible program. And part of that was to help them understand the reach, the international reach that the GLOBE program has. So um, we often shared the graphic uh, from the website, tried to make the case of the number of over 126 uh, countries participating in the GLOBE program. Um, I thought it was, uh, from my perspective, was very unique because we had diplomats, future diplomats from countries that were not uh, GLOBE uh, partners, countries. And I think that led to a great discussion uh, around the importance of uh, a shared understanding of global environmental data and, and, a, and some honest conversations about um, both the need for, but maybe sometimes the reluctance to have those shared. Um, we focused, uh, and I think GLOBE, Globe meets many of the sustainable development goals, um, but the two that were the most focused in our work was uh, the idea of quality education, how GLOBE as uh, an educational tool uh, can help uh, be built into uh, formal education settings, kind of the K-16 model, but also that uh, because of its shared nature, it does a really nice job, I think, of meeting uh, goal 17, which is partnerships. Um, you know, we talk a little bit about uh, the challenge in that um, the necessity for having individual sustainable development goals, but the fact that the uh, just the huge overlaps between the goals themselves broadly um, and that kind of goal 17 is uh, a really interesting way to help us remember and to point out the fact that these sustainable development goals are uh, intertwined. Um, so I'm going to turn this back over to Larissa. I'm sorry, it says I'm too quiet. Sure. <laughs> never been too quiet before. I've never been accused of that before. So. All right. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Jabat. Um, so uh, for those of you who are um, interested in the work of uh, UNESCO and uh, United Nations Environmental Program, you can uh, really see um, how many uh, uh, really uh, important uh, initiatives are really going hand in hand with what uh, uh, GLOBE is actually doing. We, we are um, really uh, one of the leaders in this development. And uh, we, uh, Professor Jabat and I, we thought um, you might be interested in reading uh, the one of the latest UNESCO report, uh, which really defines a new social contract for education um, uh, after uh, we experienced this uh, COVID tragedy and uh, realizing how closely we are connected with one another and the environmental programs uh, problems are not separate by any regions or countries, we all in this together. So, um, and UNESCO really defines a new, uh, new philosophy, so to speak, new vision. And um, as UNESCO defined it in this uh, report, that they see it as a new social contract for education. Uh, so, for those of you who are interested in reimagining our future together, uh, um, in the form of the report of UNESCO as a new social contract for education. We um, advise you to read it uh, and you can see immediately that every page of that report really uh, correlates to what we do and what we are committed to here in GLOBE. Maybe Professor Jabot will, uh, uh, will take this slide, uh, but it's up to you, Mike. No, sure. So, um, you know, one of the one of the opportunities that we have in GLOBE, and again, um, I think what's was really important about this work that Larissa initiated is that um, while I have built GLOBE into our undergraduate uh, science content courses, as well as our undergraduate uh, science education courses, GLOBE uh, writ large has the ability and the opportunity to help 
build this uh, idea of lifelong uh, continuum. So uh, environmental science diplomacy, the idea of helping future diplomats, helping um, uh, citizens understand the role that uh, science plays in the decisions that they're making uh, going forward um, is uh, incredibly important. You know, the, the, first, uh, the first group of speakers um, took a focus on climate in many ways and the impact that uh, climate has on people's lives. And there may be no more pressing issue societally than uh, a changing climate. And so the role that GLOBE can play in helping, um, helping people understand that, um, but also understand the way that that data, the importance of the data in informing uh, decisions and policies that move forward. Yes, thank you, uh, Professor Jibat. I, from my two cents, to add to that, um, we all asking ourselves with the climate change reality is really becoming very painfully clear that we practically running out of time. So, and I don't want to read from the slide, but there is a very nice quote from Professor Berkman, who is uh, uh, one of the leading educator in science diplomacy in the world. He's asking, do we have what it takes to come together like never before to solve these environmental problems? <clears throat> and our answer from the GLOBE community, yes, we do have those tools in our toolbox. Um, and in fact, GLOBE, uh, what, what we have been doing for many, many years, uh, uh, it's in fact, it's environmental science diplomacy or science and engineering diplomacy, if you will. So, and it's a must have skill for all students going forward for common interest building. So it's basically um, really defin defining those skills. It's going further just uh, uh, than advocating for those skills being important, but really give students uh, an algorithm and plan for how to develop those skills step by step. And, I joined Professor Jabat in um, his teaching, and it's just an honor honor to do it because he's a, also a lifelong learner himself. And um, as I always say to Professor Jabat, I wish I would be his student uh, starting from many years ago. So, uh, but it's never too late, as we say. And a couple more words to add that um, uh, the. Uh, Professor Jabad and I, we were teaching at the United Nations uh, Institute for Training and Research, uh, uh, and uh, it's spread through uh, other agencies in the United Nations. And uh, we were invited to really um, have a short course uh, presented to the um, United Nations General Assembly. The president of General Assembly has a, a brand new fellowship program uh, under the name of HOPE. So um, we were able to really uh, share the content that we, share, we we taught previously with this wonderful uh, fellowship program. And we hope that this will open other doors for, um, for uh, further uh, collaboration between GLOBE and United Nations General Assembly, uh, UNESCO um, and United Nations Environmental Program. And these, this is the picture that this was the, uh, the uh, picture taken right before COVID. Uh, Professor Jabat and I, although Professor Jabat is in New York, but not in New York City, but unfortunately it was a COVID time and we were not able to join the group for photo uh, app, but uh, we are invited to do so when um, things will go um, less, um, will be more safe to go to New York City. And we hope we will share, next year we will share our group pictures with you when we are there in person. And I would like to pass the floor back to Professor Jabat, who is um, the leader in this uh, uh, teaching uh, in, in higher education as well as K-12. Back to you, Mike. Sure. So I had, uh, I had mentioned it previously that I think one of the pieces that GLOBE allows us to do is to move the discussion about the sustainable development goals beyond just information about them, which is important. But 
uh, it globe allows us to have um, uh, gives us gives us the toolbox to be able to have students look at their local conditions around the issues that are brought forward in sustainable development goals, allowing us to teach with the goals instead of just about the goals. So uh, Larissa and I are um, have been invited to do uh, an invited chapter on the role that uh, GLOBE and citizen science uh, writ large can help in meeting the sustainable development goals. So one of the challenges that we have is that we have the goals um, are written at a very broad level, but inside each of these goals are indicators and sub indicators where uh, GLOBE can play uh, an extremely important role in helping collect data that helps uh, address the metrics around meeting those sub uh, goals in particular. And also uh, GLOBE, you know, we, we broadly as a community talk about the role that uh, uh, opportunities like IVSS and student research symposiums and that play in, in the GLOBE program for us um, the same opportunity exists when thinking about teaching with the sustainable development goals in that collecting uh, data around water quality also is helping to meet uh, goals around uh, well-being, good health and well-being, right? So uh, it's a great opportunity uh, to be able to, to build uh, an understanding in our future teachers and in community uh, and community partners as well. Um, do you want me to take I this slide? <laughs> I would love to have you do that. Yes, thank you, Professor Jabat. So as we mentioned, um, that United Nations Environmental Program uh, has a number of uh, great reports issued for educators. And among them, we, um, Professor Jabat and I, we recommend you to get familiar with a global environmental outlook for youth. So um, this is one of the unique, uh, uh, very uh, interactive uh, virtual tool, so to speak, to really bring uh, your students uh, in any ages uh, into the uh, environment uh, of United Nations uh, uh, program activities. And uh, it's really uh, been a collective effort of many scientists and engineers around the world to uh, develop this uh, substantial, um, uh, substantial and very in-depth analysis of, of a global environmental outlook, but from the perspective uh, and the point of view of youth. So it took a lot of effort to develop that report. Um, and just if I will give you a, a very a quick example that the same report, but issued for the researchers, uh, is really it's 800 pages report um, in 200 pages on the executive report is a 200 pages, uh, but it was very um, well understood and very well thought through uh, process to really uh, transforming that uh, very advanced research level uh, environmental outlook report but for, for, for the practice in the, in the school classroom for teachers and for students. Uh, so the, and the goal was to make that report uh, very interactive and very applicable to any ages, starting from the primary school and secondary school uh, included as well. So for those of you who are interested in, in this, we would recommend this is a great resource for all uh, of GLOBE teachers to use and to look um, and to use in your GLOBE classroom and the GLOBE uh, programs. And back to you on the importance of teacher professional development. All right. So uh, we know in GLOBE uh, the role that uh, professional development for teachers plays and the importance of doing that. And so uh, part of this uh, environmental science diplomacy continuum is to take advantage of what we know as a community is important for teachers and again, extend it to a larger population. So one of the greatest challenges uh, and benefits, I guess, of GLOBE is that we operate, um, systems thinking plays a central role in, 
in the work that we do, just the way we even divide up our protocols into earth spheres and, um, and the way we talk about the interaction between those spheres. So the earth is a system. Um, the same is true going back to the sustainable development goals. They feed uh, off of each other and into each other as well. Um, Larissa's uh, uh, unique focus on uh, the development of computational thinking in particular extends the work that we've done in GLOBE um, around the systems thinking piece, but now looking at the, the data, both uh, the data that's coming in new to the database, but also uh, the data that is resides in that database that gives us um, the benefit of being able to look at change over time. So all these pieces are uh, come together nicely. Um, I think extends uh, the work that we can do um, in globe, uh, at least uh, with um, with our future teachers or our current teachers or our community members in particular. Sure, and thank you, Professor Jabot. And I just would like to add, it's such an honor and a privilege to work with all faculty who devote their time and effort and energy to really teach the future teachers. And from my personal perspective, GLOBE must be a part of that education because the future generation of teachers, they must be empowered by uh, GLOBE science and GLOBE be welcomed by GLOBE community. And in fact, that's what Professor Jabat was already doing. And for those who missed the beginning of our session, just would like to remind you that Professor Jabat is teaching at SUNY University in New York State. Uh, and for those who are planning on applying for teaching, being a future teacher, I would strongly recommend you to, as I said, I would love to be a student at, in the class of Professor Jabat. That would be an honor for me. And uh, just really uh, repeating what Professor Jabat said, um, and again, for me, it's such a privilege and an honor to really be connected with Professor Jabat through uh, our uh, devotion to GLOBE. Um, and Professor Jabat been very kindly mentoring me through the process. So this is another uh, example how you can benefit from being a part of GLOBE community. So um, again, I learned a lot from uh, working with uh, GLOBE uh, team members and uh, real being, being very privileged to be a mentee of Professor Jabat. So re-emphasizing the importance of Professor Jabat um, statement on teacher professional development in GLOBE. Um, so what we do, uh, we invite um, a GLOBE community to participate in, uh, in the webinars that uh, we will be developing in 2022-2023 academic year. Um, devoted to environmental science diplomacy through education. Uh, we will have webinars on UN Sustainable Development Goals, on Global Environmental Outlook for Youth. Um, we hope to develop a, a webinar on virtual simulations uh, of the UN negotiations on the global environmental problems. So you will see uh, from the practical perspectives how those negotiations are uh, conducted and uh, why we feel that um, by learning those skills and, and really diving into this uh, uh, knowledge base, uh, all of you will, um, will benefit uh, and will, really we will all together make a bigger progress as a globe community. And as Professor Jabat says, uh, the importance of the UN Sustainable Development Goals number 17, because we both feel um, that only through uh, a very, uh, a very uh, uh, a collective effort, uh, uh, forming uh, very productive partnerships, we can accomplish any of the or any of the UN goals. And um, I joined Professor Jabot in emphasizing the importance for design thinking for Globe, as well as artificial intelligence, data, and data analytics for Globe. Although we, of course. Um, uh, not saying that we are the experts on each and every one of these fields, but we are very fortunate and blessed to have other GLOBE um, members and GLOBE experts working with us. So we hope that uh, together we would be able to bring uh, these topics through uh, virtual uh, online sessions, through webinars in the upcoming academic year. And we 
look forward to forming partnerships with you, collaborate with you. Um, we just really uh, feel that GLOBE is the perfect place for all of us to join forces um, and really to strengthen our effort to really, uh, um, to, to really emphasize the importance of the environmental science for all of us around the world. And for concluding words, I would like to uh, pass the floor to Professor Jabad. Uh, just, uh, we just both feel uh, very honored that you would attend our session today. Uh, trying to keep an eye on the chat. Uh, there's some great questions in the chat. And so I think both, um, both Larissa and I would welcome you to turn on your mics and, and ask questions. Um, I'm gonna start with, uh, Christy had a question about um, how are the, the skills that we're talking about with the environmental science diplomacy, how do they overlap or differ for climate action skills? And, and Christy, I don't think they do. I, I think part of the, well, I don't know, I'll, I'll say it this way. Maybe a mistake that we've made in climate education in the past was that we, um, we didn't take advantage of the great work like you've done and Elena and Katie have done and Greg have done around connecting climate change to people. Um, I, I think GLOBE gives us a great opportunity because of the partnerships that we have. Uh, but I think climate, um, you know, we, we could, um, you could, this is basically on, on my campus, the students who take my courses uh, have spread the word that if you're ever taking a test for me, and you're not 100% sure what caused something to happen, if you say climate change, you'll probably get some points because it's, it's probably the greatest overarching uh, upstream issue that we have for all the challenges, whether it's drought, whether it's uh, you know, drought leading uh, to a, a lack of access to food, to, uh, it's just climate is such a central, plays such a central role in what we're doing. It looks like Rebecca has a hand uh, up. Do you want to unmute yourself? Hi, Becky. Yes, certainly. Thank you for our wonderful presentation. Um, and I just wanted to mention um, something that the Science Working Group did, and I invite Malika and Hamid and whoever else is there to refresh my memory. We went through an exercise in which we try, went through the uh, SDGs, even down to the lower level with the indicators. And while there are, we, we concluded, if I remember correctly, and I can't find my spreadsheet with the information, um, that while GLOBE fit in for many of the goals, such as girls' education and whatnot, when you got down to the details, it was specific, it was difficult to match up many with protocols or scientific investigation because many of the indicators are so narrowly defined um and so it just we we could share if i'll find that information and, and again Malika, if you remember anything more about what we talked about and what we concluded please share but i think there should be at least uh, maybe a sharing of what we found and what you've been doing because it might be so it might help or maybe not i don't know no, no, becky <laughs> thank you you know we we started with the document that uh, had been posted. I, I think it was. Um, I think it was tied, but it, just the overlap between education. I think it focused on water, on uh, life under the water, and life on land. I think broadly, and you're uh, you're absolutely right <laughs> that when you look at the sub indicators in the SDGs, um, it's a little. It is difficult if you want to try to have a one-to-one -one correlation. But uh, the work that, um, that I've been trying to advocate for is that some of the, pro the data that we collect with some of our protocols can be uh, very nice um, proxies for other, other indicators that are directly mentioned. So, I mean, when the UN was putting their sustainable development goals together, they weren't thinking about the world. Right, they weren't thinking about what we called a globe protocol or things like that. So I think there's some really nice proxies for doing that, you know. So, but thank you, thanks for uh, pointing that out. And for Wonderful, the, thank you. 
Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you, uh, Professor Jabal. Uh, for those of you who are um, not seeing the chat room, I would like to recognize Allison, who put a really uh, important link into the chat room for um, uh, for for an important document. And Allison, if you're able to unmute yourself, uh, it, we would be honored to hear from you. Thank you, Allison. The floor is yours. Oh. So that link is to that one pager that I think that Becky was referring to. I just wanted to help out and stick okay. that in there. Um, but what I do think is, um, I'll just comment about your talk, both Mike and Larissa, that I found it really interesting about how you were using GLOBE to support the education goals and supporting um, the partnership goals of the sustainable development goals. And to be perfectly honest, as someone who comes at many things with a science angle, I hadn't considered those perspectives. I'm somewhat embarrassed now that I hadn't considered those perspectives, but I'm really glad that you, you raised them because it's given me ways to think about how GLOBE connects to the sustainable development goals beyond the data that we collect. Um, because that's important, but there's many other their connections too. And I've been making some notes here because some other things that you've said about how GLOBE helps people understand the science behind why climate is changing is also very powerful to enable people to understand the scope and magnitude of the problems and potentially their role that they could take in addressing some of the concerns and some of the challenges that our society faces. So I really appreciate the multiple perspective of the science diplomacy on both the diplomatic side, the science side, and the education side um, was, I just really enjoyed it. And that was the other comment that I put in the chat, along with the fact that something you may wanna consider looking into is UN USA, which is the UN Office on Outer Space Affairs, which also has a space for youth um, activity. Um, I've actually talked about climate change there and threw in some stuff about GLOBE, but in, if you're interested in this space, it may be something else to explore. And uh, Lynn Wigwells, I think, is also connected up in a couple of different ways. So um, I just kind of wanted to put that information out there. And thank you for your great talk. Thank you, Allison. Yes, everything that we did, um, uh, we uh, we follow the communication protocol, and we would like to acknowledge Lynn and Jen and all uh, all our team members um, uh, that we uh, stated in our special thank you note on our presentation. Because for all of you who are listening to this in recording or who are here in live presentation, we would like to acknowledge this is a team effort, and this is one of the examples. Uh, it's, it's basically started from a grassroots movement. So um, a lot of teachers really approaching us and really they intuitively feel, um, especially the young generation of future teachers, they really, uh, are, really emphasize the importance for environmental science diplomacy because they were the first ones who, at least in my practice, I'm sure Professor Jabot can share his experience, but in my uh, practice as a US GLOBE partner here in Massachusetts, uh, they feel this is uh, a must have skill for the 21st century. So for uh, basically moving from advocacy to a practical uh, sort of how to the algorithm, how to build a common interest around the UN global, uh, 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 sustainable development goals. Because we talk about so many different environmental issues, but uh, the umbrella uh, uh, that we are not really pointing uh, uh, before as much as we do it now is anything and everything is possible only and only if we join forces. And not, it's not always that obvious because there are many cultural differences there are many geographical locations. There are many different challenging developments. So for all of us to really collaborate with United Nations on how they do these things, how they work across different boundaries and challenges. So um, I'm really grateful for uh, my experience learning from teachers and for, from Professor Jabat really pointing out uh, on this important skill, on how to build a common interest. Basically, what is the 
plan, how you how you develop those skills, and uh, most importantly, how you pass on this experience to your students, how you teach them to really build partnerships across the globe. Um, and with that, I really would like again to reemphasize the importance of Allison leadership in at NASA and all, all the partners and sponsors and all of those who are supporting GLOBE since day one many, many years ago. It's really a truly a team effort. And with, a, with that, uh, my hats off to you, Allison, and your, in your presence, hats off to all NASA uh, uh, team and all GLOBE community. And for the closing, I would like to pass it to Professor Jabbat. Thank you. And I echo everything that Larissa said. I think. Uh, this work uh, and GLOBE in general, right? The GLOBE community deserves all the credit for these kinds of things um, uh, occurring. And I think as a GLOBE community, I think we continue to expand uh, both our reach and our impact. And I think that's what's really exciting about a program that um, uh, has the long history that it has. It has lots of, lots of programs sort of uh, lose their momentum as it moves forward. I think we're, as a community, GLOBE is gaining momentum, which I think is really exciting. Mike, can I ask some question? Sure. Uh, can you some more on design thinking for GLOBE? Because design thinking is about, uh, you know, like uh, five uh, processes, right? And then uh, the, by the fourth process, you have prototype and then you test it and then you, uh, you, you know, and then you come with uh, some products or something like that. But uh, how, how that uh, related to the GLOBE program? Yeah, I'm gonna let- uh, Sure, sure. Uh, I'm gonna let Larissa take that on. I mean, I can talk about the work that, that we've done here using that engineering, that. Uh, th that design thinking sort of process. Um, I, you know, I think the benefit um, that we have in GLOBE is that we have long established protocols. Uh, those protocols, because they are so well established, so well thought out, so well tested, I think it makes a case that um, that level of data collected with those, that level of protocol Right. So if the work that, you know, Chris had shared with me around uh, air quality and water quality, where he had sort of taken those protocols and now try to introduce new technologies. I think that for my in my perspective, that has been uh, a huge, a huge piece that we can because we can fall back on the protocol from globe. But I'm going to let Larissa do a better job answering. Oh, no, I wouldn't be able to do a better job. I just will add a couple cents from my perspective. Yeah. Um, I came to uh, education from professional engineering. So uh, I am a licensed professional engineer. I'm a petroleum engineer and environmental engineer after I experienced everything that petroleum engineering looks like in practice. So I am really devoting my effort to environmental engineering now. So um, yes, uh, design thinking, you're absolutely right. And from my perspective, the product itself, uh, uh, where are we coming from? It's basically uh, the educational curriculum and in instructional materials for uh, for uh, for primary, secondary, and post-secondary education. So um, we can also talk about other so-named products that GLOBE uh, is massively producing. There are many, many products uh, uh, starting from uh, research uh, in, uh, in all the data collection and the data analytics. But in our case, as I privilege to work with Professor Jabbat in our specific case, the product that we are considering is a curriculum development. So, um, uh, and it goes through the same stages. And also I'm really thrilled that Professor Jabbat going further than that, because we are seeing things from a, a systemic perspective. So a system design perspective. Uh, and uh, for those of you who are interested in diving a little bit more deeper in design thinking and in and, and system uh, systems perspective, we will have a, a GLOBE webinar in the upcoming academic year. We are going to develop it with other experts in the GLOBE. We're not going to do it alone. 
uh, and among other experts that we are planning on inviting uh, is uh, MIT, um, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, the System Design Thinking Association, uh, and the president of that association. Uh, we are currently exploring the opportunity for her to speak to our global community. Uh, so we think it will really be very interesting and exciting webinar. So uh, we hope that we will continue work and collaborate on all of these topics uh, in, the, in the upcoming academic year. And uh, Malika, I hope uh, I answered your question. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, th th thank you for actually clarifying this because uh, most of the time when people are thinking about design thinking, they think about, uh, you know, get empathized and then understanding and from the user point of view and then come up with the products. But it's kind of interesting to hear that you think of the product itself is a curriculum. It's not absolutely not, yeah. it's not like regular product that um, most uh, most of us thinking of. Thank you. Sure. And we are strictly following the same protocol through design, uh, through uh, design thinking as we are doing it in engineering or scientific world. Uh, because quite honestly, without empathizing with the world uh, in, uh, in bringing uh, that empathy in the world of education, we're not able to really get, prepare the next generation. It's a huge challenge, and you know, we're all in this together. And seeing from UNESCO and United Nations perspective, it's also a big challenge because there are so many educational systems around the world. So how you unite forces in educating students uh, 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 across this educational, across the differences in educational systems. It's not that easy, it's not that simple task. And uh, I think uh, Professor Jabat knows about this much more than I do, uh, but um, I studied at Harvard the uh, um, comparative analysis uh, of different educational systems, but that's basically all my experience. Uh, but again, uh, emphasizing uh, of educators um, challenge uh, uh, how you unite uh, across different educational systems, how you define, how you develop a curriculum that really fits all these uh, needs and how you, how you develop collaborative instructional materials. When globe, globe virtual classrooms are connecting with one another, they coming they coming from all uh, parts of the world. So how you advise uh, those educators uh, in globe to really conduct those classroom activities if they are coming from different perspectives uh, and having different instructional materials and different curriculum. So it's a huge challenge. Uh, maybe Professor Jabat would like to add a couple more words on that. Other than I agree, it's a huge challenge. I. <laughs> Um, you know, I think Katie just in sort of in passing, right, talked about this uh, young people's urge to have action taken, right? So climate is a climate is a, a, a perfect example of this. I think what is really unique about GLOBE to this idea about design thinking and the challenge that we have is that because we have the partnerships developed the way they are, um, I think GLOBE uh, empowers future, uh, empowers students, whether they're, however we define students, whether it's K-12 students or future teachers, uh, empowers them uh, to, to learn about the world around them locally, right? And then be able to uh, expand that understanding uh, even if the action is uh, actions of empathy and, and trying to find ways to be able to support others around the world. So. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jibot. Globe, Globe, Globe is pretty cool. That's how I usually end my sessions. Globe is pretty cool. So. Looks like Rebecca has uh, another urgent question. Go ahead, yeah. Rebecca. She's giving us a high yeah. five. But yeah, no, I'm, <laughs> obviously I'm getting very enthusiastic with all of the all of the uh, presentations and um, making one connection that it, I, I'm at Brooklyn College um, in New York 
And uh, the past couple of years, there's been a lot of soul searching uh, among our faculty to decolonize the curriculum. And so I think in, in that, this is looking at the undergraduate and graduate level, but also, and I think a lot of you are already doing that or have been doing that without necessarily labeling it as decolonizing uh, the curriculum. And so um, I'm just, it was just another connection that I wanted to share uh, that, um, you know, in my thinking as I move forward, whether it be an undergraduate level or in other activities and making those those connections with different community groups, different underrepresented groups and drawing on their knowledge and sharing of knowledge for products or whatever that they're doing. So I just wanted to share that that thought with you. Sure. Um, and with that, we're coming to the end of our presentation. And I would like to thank you again uh, for uh, for your attention. It was such a privilege and an honor to uh, present to you and our very special thanks again to Allison, to Tony, to all country coordinators and special thank you to Ling Wigbill, Wigbills who been with us all the steps of the way uh, as this ground sort of uh, from, from the ground up, from grassroots up initiative was developing. She provided a lot of support uh, and we are really grateful for that. Needless to say, again, that uh, the leader in environmental science diplomacy education, Professor Jabat, and I am humble, his teaching assistant, so to speak. I'm really uh, honored and privileged to continue working with Professor Jabat and with all of you. And we look forward to seeing you at our webinars in the academic year 2022-2023. And we thank all of you attending today and all of you who are listening and all of you who are going to continue work with us um, in the years to come. Um, Globe community is the fantastic uh, place to be. It's very inclusive, very welcoming, and we all are happy to work with you with that. Thank you. Unless Professor Jabot has the last word to say, <laughs> I will pass it on to Madeline and to Grace to finish it up. Great. Thank you both so much. That was a very, very wonderful presentation. Um, we are done with this session. I do want to remind everyone, 7 a.m. tomorrow, we have some more ex exciting sessions that you can attend. And there is a U.S. Partners session after this as well for U.S. Partners. Uh, yeah, so it's been fantastic. Thank you all for attending. Uh, I'd also like to remind everyone that there are polls after each session. Um, where you can collect, we'll, we are collecting feedback on all of the speakers and how the annual meeting is going. Um, and you will find that in the virtual platform. So please uh, take those and check them out. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Madeline. You are working hard behind the scenes. So it's really greatly appreciated. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. You too. <laughs>